Tonight, bandits strike again in Kaduna, kill company driver and kidnap 33 persons in Kachia local government area of the state. Governor Zulum alleges corruption by officials and the use of funds targeted at addressing humanitarian crisis in Northeast. UNDP estimates over 1 million deaths by 2030 in the troubled region. Operatives of the Lagos Police Command arrest 21-year-old undergraduate suspected to have murdered Super TV Chief Executive Officer Michael Ataga. And at least one person dead while search continues for over 90 others after the partial collapse of a 12-story residential building in Miami, Florida. Plus, this is sports news from Abuja and later international news from our studio in London. On business news tonight, federal government highlights plans to finance institutions to support micro, small and medium business development and reduce unemployment in the country. On sports news tonight, Nigeria's first Olympic gold medalist Choma Ajunwa and 1994 AFCON winning Super Eagles get their houses years after their exploits. And from Abuja, the federal capital territory records 91 suspected cases of cholera and seven deaths between May and June. We begin in Kaduna State, where at least one person has been killed and 33 others abducted following an attack by bandits suspected to be kidnappers in Kachia local government area of the state. The incident, which occurred last night within Kachia metropolis, also left several people injured. The district head of Kachia ward, Idris Suleiman, says the bandits and their large numbers invaded the community at about 9 p.m. Wednesday night, started shooting sporadically in a bid to create panic among the residents. The Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Mr. Samuel Arwan, visited the community today and told residents that efforts are currently ongoing to apprehend the perpetrators. Bandits in recent times have left Kaduna in a state of unrest, with many killed and several others kidnapped for ransom, including students of various institutions. <laughs> On Wednesday night, bandits in their large numbers invaded Kachia metropolis, where they attacked traders and a nearby bakery. They also abducted five persons and killed a driver. They came and stood at the, and positioned themselves at different places by our junction, leading to our villages. There they attempted entering a house of uh, one alleged to know where there is bakery. There they shot his driver and killed him and abducted four people there. The bandits also raided another location popularly called Mother Cat, where they kidnapped not less than 28 people, including a pregnant woman, from their homes. Residents say it would have been worse if not for the timely arrival of security operatives. They carry all the children except one. They carry seven children and go out with them. They were about to go into the bush when they release her, because she cannot walk at all. Kachia is home to two military institutions, the Nigerian Army School of Artillery and the Navy School of Armaments Technology. Yet some communities in the area have had their bitter taste of bandits' attack. It's a problem that is multidimensional. Once you tackle this problem in a particular occasion, another corridor uh, open, like uh, you see. but. We are not relenting, like I said. Security agencies are trailing them from uh, the reports that uh, we have. People called us that they saw them. By the time we moved there, they said they've gone to Qatari. So they are still in the bush now, moving and following them. These guys, they explore the bush. There's no way I can come to this place now and know where the toilet is or know where the bedroom is. Right? Without someone directing me. Thank you. So, some people are directing these guys. And they are one of us. The Kaduna State Government is emphasizing the need for a strong collaboration between the people, government at local levels, and security agencies in the areas of sharing intelligence information that will help fish out the criminals within their domain. 
From Kaduna to Borno State, where Governor Babagana Zulum has accused the United Nations of mismanagement of funds donated for displaced persons in northeast Nigeria, he shares his thoughts at the government house when the UN humanitarian coordinator, Edward Kalon, led ambassadors of donor countries to Borno State. The UN delegation paid a courtesy call on the governor after interacting with the internally displaced in temporary shelters within Meduguri. Ambassadors of donor countries and other international organizations are in Bornu State on a courtesy visit, sequel to the UN's request during the last G7 meeting to address humanitarian crisis in northeast Nigeria. The UN humanitarian coordinator in Nigeria, Mr. Edward Callan, takes the visitors on a tour of internally displaced persons camp in Midugri, the capital city. Gentlemen of us. Their next port of call the is the theatre the command the where issues of security, especially renewed attacks on civilians and aid workers, are discussed. Then the team moves to the United Nations office where they stress their commitment to respond to the urgent humanitarian needs in Nigeria. Unfortunately, we're seeing uh, a worsening situation over the last uh, few months. Uh, including attacks on uh, civilians, increased attack on civilians, but also attacks uh, from ISWAP on, uh, on humanitarian workers. So this is obviously something that's very concerning for us. They retire to the state government house where they are received by Governor Babaka Nazulum. Here, the UN coordinator announces other commitments by donor countries such as the Canadian government's pledge to support aid action in the region. I am so pleased, sitting down with the ambassador of Canada today, that just after a few hours, we can see a formidable announcement of well over $30 million, $30 million to support people that have been affected by this crisis in East Nigeria. The state government welcomes all the support it can get to address the humanitarian situation, but Governor Zulum says he's not impressed with the way these funds are being handled. UN systems will be with us so that the money has to be channeled to the right corners. These are taxpayers' money, and there must be transparency in the system. Honestly speaking, I don't want to mention it, but I keep on saying that there's a lot of corruption in the system. Why? Because we are not involved in many of the things. If we are involved, we will try as much as possible to, to be transparent. According to the United Nations, Insurgency in the Northeast has led to one of the largest humanitarian crises in the world. This year alone, at least 8.7 million people were found to be in need of assistance, out of which no fewer than 4.4 million are expected to be in dire need of food in the current lean season. The United Nations Development Programme is projecting that the death rate in the insurgency crisis in the Northeast is expected to rise to 1.1 million by 2030. The country representative of UNDP, Mr. Mohamed Yahya, presented the findings during a virtual presentation of a report on the assessment of the impact of conflict on development in the Northeast. The report shows that at least 35,000 people have been killed directly in the insurgency between 2009 and 2020. Our correspondent, Emperor Simon, reports. Twelve years of conflict with enormous impact. At least 380,000 people have been killed, both directly and indirectly, in the Northeast insurgency. The latest report by the United Nations Development Program in Nigeria shows more than 1.8 million people have been displaced in Adamawa, Borno and Yobe states alone, in addition to 280,000 living as refugees in neighboring countries of Cameroon, Chad and Niger Republic. The, report, the situation the could get worse, uh, as presented by the UNDP country the representative, report. Mr. Mohamed Yaya during a virtual presentation of a report on the assessment of the impact of conflict on development in the Northeast region. Each direct deaths uh, in the Northeast, uh, and nine others die indirectly. Essentially, uh, what you see in the direct death 
does not show the, the indirect death of each individual state. So for example, here we say one in nine. Uh, uh, this is what the report uh, finds out in terms of direct deaths. And if everything remains constant by 2030, more than 1.1 million uh, Northeastern Nigerians will have been directly or indirectly lost their lives because of the conflict. Women and children are mostly affected, accounting for 80% of internally displaced people. Every day of continued conflict results uh, in the death of 170 children below five years of age. And this will increase to 240 children per day. The conflict in the Northeast has also plunged at least 1.4 million people into poverty, Yobe State having the highest figure of people living below the poverty line of $1.9 per day. 1.8 million children who will have been enrolled in school today are not because of the conflict. 81% of people in Yobe, 64% of people in Borno, and 60% in people in Adamawa suffer from multidimensional poverty, which is directly related to continued insurgency. The UNDP report shows progress in the Northeast could be stalled if the conflict continues through 2030. More than half of the population will remain in extreme poverty. Over 1.1 million children will die unnecessarily and 40% of the children under five will suffer from malnutrition. Hence, the call on the government to redouble its effort in the fight against insurgency. Emperor Simon, Channel Television News. President Mohamed Buhari has tasked the National Space Research and Development Agency to effectively utilize the satellite facilities at its disposal towards resolving the critical issues confronting Nigeria, particularly in areas of security, improved communication, digital penetration, as well as agriculture. The President gave the charge at the 2021 National Space Council meeting at the State House. He later met separately with the President of Senate, Senator Ahmed Lawan, in his office. Our State House correspondent, Gloria Mizuke, reports. President Mohamed Buhari presides over the 2021 National Space Council meeting with some members of the Federal Executive Council in attendance. The President wants the space sector to advance security in the country. Being the recipient of very strong government support, I also must ask you, with the mandate of working with other agencies and components of government, on how you could best utilize the tools at your disposal in resolving some of those critical issues that confront us as a country. Issues regarding security, improved communication, and digital penetration, and importantly, agriculture. Hours later, the president also met with the executive council of the National Ijo Congress. Addressing several issues, including the call for immediate restructuring, the president notes that the National Assembly has concluded regional consultations. <laughs> Separately, the president of the Senate arrives to meet with the president in his office. Nigeria is poor with low investment prospects, says the president of the Senate after the meeting. We will not be frivolous and will not uh, uh, take it lightly to just approve any loan. And our options are really very limited as a country. First, we don't have the necessary revenues. Nigeria is poor. We shouldn't deceive ourselves. Nigeria is not rich. Uh, given the circumstances we live in, given the challenges we have, our resources are so low, our revenues are so low. You cannot, in my view and judgment, tax Nigerians further for you to raise the money for infrastructure development. Other countries do that, but we have serious situation across the country. So the only option left is for us to borrow, borrow responsibly, utilize prudently and economically that Nigerian economy will benefit from the implementation of such infrastructure development. 
The President of the Senate has been speaking quite frankly about how, by implication, Nigeria's debt profile might continue to rise because it has become an absolute necessity to borrow. Now, how best Nigeria will offset the approximately 32 trillion naira remains the tricky question. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, a statement from the special advisor to the president on media and publicity, Mr. Femi Adishino, says the president will depart the nation's capital, Abuja, tomorrow for a scheduled medical follow-up in London. He's due back in the country during the second week of July 2021. In part two, after the break, again, INEC chair chairman raises concern over security as the commission begins continuous voter registration next week. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Bandits strike again in Kaduna, kill company driver and kidnap 33 persons in Kachia, local government area of the state. Governor Zulum alleges corruption by officials and the use of funds targeted at addressing humanitarian crisis in Northeast. UNDP estimates over 1 million deaths by 2030 in the troubled region. Operatives of the Lagos Police Command arrest 21-year-old undergraduate suspected to have murdered Super TV Chief Executive Officer Michael Ataga. And at least one person dead while search continues for over 90 others after the partial collapse of a 12-story residential building in Miami, Florida. Now, ahead of the commencement of the continuous voter registration by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, the chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, is raising concern about the safety of its staff and equipment. The commission says it will now embark on the registration in phases, with the online portal opening on June the 28th, followed by scheduled appointments with those who have concluded their online process before physical capturing of prospective voters. INEC plans to deploy 5,346 staff and equipment to various centers across the country. As we are aware, the Commission has had the sad experience of recent attacks on our offices across the country. In most cases, these offices have been burnt or vandalized. Clearly, the aim of the attackers was to undermine the Commission's capacity to organize elections and other electoral activities, including the CBR. Although the attacks have subsided, the Commission is still deeply worried about the threat they could pose to registrants and our staff during the CBR. As a result of this profound concern, the Commission has decided to modify the schedule for the CBR as follows. Number one, commencement of online registration only, Monday, 28th June 2021. Number two, commencement of scheduled appointments for online registrants, 19th July 2021. And finally, commencement of physical CBR at all other registration centers. The date is to be determined based on evaluation of the security situation and the location as I said earlier, will be in the 2,763 registration centers nationwide. And to other stories, days after the search for the killer of the chief executive officer of Super TV, Mr. Michael Ataga, a 21-year-old undergraduate student of the University of Lagos, has been identified by the police as the suspected killer. While parading the suspect before journalists at the police headquarters in Ikeja, the Commissioner of Police, Hakim Udumosu, explains that the suspect has confessed to committing the crime, giving further lead to the police to expand its investigation. I was, I was, I was trying to, eat, I was sleep, I was trying to sleep. It was midnight, so we, we have drank and we have um, smoked. So I was already like sleepy, and then, Continue. and then I was already sleepy, and then when it came on to me, I was resisting. 
that was what happened. It was it was violent about it. The instance, the first one on on the next side, that was the first one. And then when when I stabbed him to the the first one twice, I threw the knife on the bed. Then he was going for it while I went for it. So while I laid on the bed, that's when it came on me to to hold the knife and that's why I managed to stab him with the knife and then and then when he dragged the knife from me he managed to slice my hand and then as he was holding it the knife broke so it slipped off from his hand. I still managed to held held to it but then it was now weak and then he fell on the floor. We have arrested her, she has confessed, but in law, that's not enough when you are going to court. We still need medical proof. We want the, the clothes to wore when it didn't happen and where the blood of the victim. So, took all the clothes which is in our custody with our computer statements and we started to work. So, the next stage is now for the autopsy. So, the family and the pathologist will determine that. But it's an integral part of the investigation to murder cases which we are going to set out. Let's now join Linda Kibwe. She has some more stories from Abuja Studios. Linda. Hello, Millicent. The Federal Capital Territory has recorded a total of 91 suspected cases of cholera and seven deaths between May and June 23rd, 2021. Confirming the cases, the Acting Secretary of the FCT Health and Human Services Secretariat, Dr. Mohamed Kawu, explains that the cases were reported in Abuja Municipal, Buari and Gwagwalada Area Councils. Dr. Kawu adds that the deaths were recorded in the Municipal Area Council. We have this. From May 2021, FCT began to receive reports of sporadic cases of gastrointestinal gastroenteritis in some communities in the FCT, more especially in Wasa, IDP camp, Day Day, Zuba community, Shengamu and Kuwa from communities. Drawn from three area councils, namely municipal, Buari and Gwabala the area councils of the Federal Capital Territory and Section. As of today, 23rd, as of yesterday, sorry, 23rd, 6th, 2021, a total of 91 suspected cases have so far been enlisted, with seven deaths in municipal area council that is related to this ailment. But there is no death from Guagulada and Buari area councils. Out of this, three cases have tested positive for cholera using the rapid diagnosis test. In the light of the foregoing, therefore, FCT residents are requested to report any case of diarrhea disease to the nearest health facility or the Department of Public Health for necessary action. The River State Government has flagged off the first phase of the landmark Trans-Calabari Road, which cuts across three local government areas of Asari Toru, Akukutoru and Degema. For Governor Nielsen Wike, the project will put an end to the politicization of a Trans-Calabari Road and open up the area for more development. The member of the PDP Board of Trustees and special guest Ferdinand de la Brabra, who performed the flag of exercise, commended the governor for fulfilling his electoral promises. <laughs> A day after flagging of the Abonima Obonoma land reclamation project, the River State Government is back in the coastal area to flag off yet another landmark project, the Trans Calabari Road. The road connects the Calabari ethnic nationality, cutting across Akukutoru, Asaritoru, and Degama local government areas, and the state government is here to kick off the first phase of the project. For Governor Yes on Wiki, the project will put an end to the consistent politicization of the landmark road during electionary seasons. Today is an epoch making day because all of us know the history 
as regards this Transcalabari Road. All of us politicians who have played politics with Transcalabari Road. Everybody who wants to contest the election in River State will want to say, if you vote for us, we will do Transcalabari Road. And you have been voting for them and us. But to the glory of God, today, nobody will play politics again with the issue of Transcalabari Road. The special guest, a member of the PDP Board of Trustees, Ferdinand Anabraba, commends Governor Wike for paying attention to the needs of the people. Your Excellency, I wish to thank you very, 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 very immensely. And most sincerely, for yet another honor for me today, being your special guest for the flag off of the trans Road Project this laudable project, conceived over 15 years ago, remained a dream all these years. Your Excellency, you came in, and today our dream has now come true. The River State Governor has promised to complete all projects his administration initiates, and it is expected that when the road is completed, the coastal area will be better integrated into the state's economy. When the news at 10 returns, the federal government highlights plans by finance institutions to support micro, small and medium business development and reduce unemployment in the country. That's in business news. Join us again. You're welcome back to the news at 10, coming to you live from Abuja. GTCO has commissioned its training complex, which will also serve as GT Bank's regional office in Abiyokuta, the Ogun State Capital. The opening ceremony of the facility also featured a commemoration service in honor of late Tayo Aderioku, former managing director and co-founder of GT Bank, after whom the complex is named. Abelkuta gets a new landmark, an elegant, eye-catching, nine floors, eight-story building at the heart of the evolving Central Business District. It's the GT Co. Training Complex and Regional Office of GT Bank, named after the former MD and co-founder, Tayo Adirinokun, who died 10 years ago. The bank's chief executive officer, Shengu Agbaje, says, Tayo's legacy is captured in putting up the complex. Everything we do is created around this learning. It then brings me to Uncle T, who I think was one of the people who have contributed most to this. Not only did he believe in a learning organization, most Nigerians are very good at using other people's monies. He used his money to basically do this. In Abel Kuta, you have today one of the best secondary schools in the country, Day Waterman College. A brief commemorative service holds for the late co-founder. Dignitaries who played significant role in the realization of this dream expressed their delight at the result. Today, thank GT that you are giving Ogun State today the tallest building here in the city in the heart of Abiyokuta. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. But well, one thing is sure, the management of GTB was quick to identify the new and fast emerging economy that Ogun State is becoming and they want to be there when it begins and it begins to happen. Guarantee Trust has become a holding company. Um, we, I think we were successful as a bank, and now we would like to diversify our earnings base. The cutting of the ribbon is followed by a tour of the 105-room complex, which also has six lecture rooms, one main auditorium, gym, lounge, cafeteria and more.
The umbrella body of insurance companies in Nigeria, the Nigerian Insurance Association, NIA, has held the investiture of Mr. Gani Musa as its 24th chairman to steer the affairs of the underwriting trade group for the next two years. At the investiture ceremony in Lagos, the new chairman of the NIA said improving the attractiveness of insurance as an investment vehicle and working with the National Assembly to modernize primary insurance law will be his focus in office. It's an evening of joy and accomplishments as friends and members of the Nigerian Insurers Association gather to witness the investiture of the 24th chairman of the group. A landmark event that should have happened in 2020. This investiture ceremony of the 24th chairman of our noble association offers an ample opportunity to forge closer ties with all stakeholders in the insurance industry. For the Commissioner of Insurance, the field remains a useful tool for managing risks and an important aspect of any operation as it commends the sector for its role during the COVID-19 pandemic. The insurance sector's financial contribution to the federal government and the provision of insurance cover to frontline health workers in the country in the bid to curb the pandemic remains indelible in the history of our dear nation. Quest, our distinguished past chairman, and to the main highlight of the day as Mr. Ghani Musa becomes the 24th president of the NIA. Thank you very much, ladies. Uh, can the applause be better? Thank you very much, sir. Very proud to Then the man of the moment spells out his assignment in a three-plan agenda. A very critical element is the question of the legal and the regulatory advoc advocacy to improve the attractiveness of insurance as an investment vehicle. We plan to continue to work with the National Assembly and NICOM to modernize the primary insurance laws. There's no doubt that he will run with the vision. It's coming in at a time when the industry is going through a kind of transformation because we need to strengthen uh, the insurance companies and build stronger ones. Assuming the office just to run and then ensure transformation of the industry. Please. With a new leader in for the NIA, Chairman, most members believe the association is just set to, to look inwards nature. to take advantage of the untapped Chairman, potential demand the for insurance Chairman. in Nigeria. Our royal fathers are they here? That's all from Abuja. Back to you, Millicent. Thanks, Linda. Popular Yoruba actor Lariwajo Minka, also known as Babai Jesha, has been granted bail by a special offences and domestic violence court sitting in the Keja area in the sum of two million naira with two sureties. He was granted bail after earlier pleading not guilty to the offence and has been released to the head of his legal team, Babatunde Ogala. The court held that the sureties must be a blood relation. Residents in Lagos must have tax clearance certificate of three years preceding today. Such relation must also make a monetary bond of one million naira to the chief registrar of the court. The other surety must be a legal practitioner whose court to bar certificate must be verified by the court. He has seven days to perfect the bail. The court has adjourned till the 26th, 27th and 28th of July for the prosecution to open its case against the defendant. And next is business news. Here's Anne Walder. Let's begin business news with the Nigerian Export Promotion Council saying that Nigeria could improve the employment rate as well as earn to up to $16 billion yearly by outsourcing digital skills. According to the Executive Secretary of the NEPC, Mr. Lushegma Wolowo, it could be made possible by supporting skills acquisition and adequately financing MSMEs. Mr. Wolowo stated this during a national discourse on MSMEs. Meanwhile, Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo, who was represented by the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, says the federal government has introduced arrangements in the development of financial institutions to de-risk lending to small and medium-scale enterprises. The National MSME Discourse is one of the activities lined up to commemorate the MSME Week. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Industry giants are gathered to deliberate on improvements that could be made to boost the impact of micro, small and medium enterprises, especially having been hit the hardest by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the World Economic Forum, 97 million new jobs will be created by 2025, out of which 80% will be outsourced. By training our graduates in these high in demand skills, Nigeria could potentially be earning some $16 billion yearly from outsourcing uh, of digital uh, skills. It is equally important to mention the National Enterprise Development Program, NEDEP, which has mapped out strategies for the coordination of the delivery of enterprises development in the country. Vice President Yamiyo Shinbajo, who is the special guest, is represented by the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment. We have introduced arrangements in our development finance institutions to the risk lending to MSMEs. Similarly, we have exempted small businesses with a turnover of less than 20 million from tax, while those with a turnover of less than 100 million now benefit from a one-third reduction in the corporate income tax rate from 30% to 20%. The conversation breaks into two sessions to look at financing the Nigerian MSME and facilitating as well as growing a sustainable MSME space. Working with the Bankers Committee, what we've done is to create or put in place a national microfinance bank. And that national microfinance bank is going to exist in all the 774 local governments of the country. All borrowings from Bank of Industry now are either at 8% based on the money of Bank of Industry or 5% based on the monies that we manage for Central Bank. When there's a structure and when there's a process that allows flexibility for any small enterprise, it makes them to be able to tackle challenges when they come and, of course, use um, scalable solutions to, to solve the problem. Nigeria's MSMEs account for 96% of the total number of businesses in the country and contribute about 50% to the national GDP. After three days of downtrend, Nigeria's stock market made a U-turn to the green territory today at the close of business, trading on bargain hunting for Boa cement and, of course, some other key components across four sectors of the listed equities. Any John Mekwa has the details. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Well, for the first time this week, the bull re-emerged at the local equities market after three days of absence. What a relief. At the close of trading today, the All Share Index was up 0.4% at almost 38,000 points. Investors took advantage of the drop in the share price of components from the banking, industrial goods, and oil and gas counters. This made them the most positively active today. Industrial goods rose by a wide margin, almost 1%. Banking, which drove the market down yesterday, also ended up in the green zone, up. 0.61%. Now, tier one lender, GT Bank shares, which was placed on full suspension last week by the NGX to allow it to transform into a holding company, is now GT Co. Now, after the suspension, this perhaps attracted investors because it was a major driver of the banking counter. Almost 7 million of its shares were traded today alone. Out of 18 advances, Portland Paint and Mutual Benefits took the lead, gaining about 10% each while Learn Africa trailed far behind with 4% gain. On the flip side, ICO Group, Champs PLC, and Champion Brewers led 10 others. About 78 billion naira has been regained from the three sessions of losses. We should cruise into the green zone tomorrow, hopefully. That's the Stock Market Report. I'm Ini John Mekwa. And that's Business News Tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. It's back to you, Millicent. As many as 99 people remain unaccounted for following the partial collapse of a 12-story building in Surfside, Florida. 36 people have been rescued from the rubble, including a young boy this evening. More than 80 fire and rescue officers are at the scene, as President Joe Biden says federal resources, including assistance from FEMA, are ready to go. The governor is also expected to declare a state of emergency. Here's Simon Pusey with more international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. 
Thousands across Hong Kong have rushed to snap up the final edition of the pro-democracy newspaper, The Apple Daily, which closed its doors after 26 years. Hours after the company announced its closure, supporters of the tabloid gathered outside its office even as heavy rain fell. They lit their phone flashlights as a show of solidarity and shouted supporting slogans. The final edition was a tribute to its readers, with the headline, Hong Kongers bid a painful farewell in the rain. The publication decided to shut down after its reports were accused of breaching a national security law, leading to a freeze on company assets. A huge rescue operation is underway in Florida after a 12-story building partially collapsed, killing at least one person. Images show a huge pile of rubble hanging down one side of a residential apartment building. At least one woman has died and eight people have been injured, although that figure is likely to rise. There are fears that others are trapped in the debris. The collapse is said to have occurred at around 2 a.m. local time. Miami-Dade Fire Rescue said they had sent 80 vehicles to the scene and police are also assisting with the rescue operation. The Ethiopian army has denied that civilians were targeted or killed in the airstrike at Togogo village outside Tigray's capital, Mekele. The army's spokesperson told journalists that the airstrike's targets were rebel fighters who were gathered to celebrate Martyrs Day. Eyewitnesses and hospital sources said dozens might have been killed or injured in the airstrikes. Colonel Getnet has also denied claims by rebel fighters of military gains, including control of some key areas. A priest has been arrested in Athens in Greece after he threw acid on seven bishops of the Greek Orthodox Church. The attack took place during a disciplinary hearing against the 36-year-old priest. Three bishops are being treated in hospital for burns, mostly on their faces. A policeman who ran to help the bishops was also taken to hospital. The suspect was a priest accused of being involved in drug trafficking. The lawyer of the technology entrepreneur, John McAfee, says his family are enraged and in pain after his death in prison. Okay, uh, Sammy, I'm uh, just sitting down with uh, Reuters News. McAfee, the antivirus software pioneer, died by suicide in a Barcelona prison after the Spanish High Court authorized his extradition to the United States on tax evasion charges. He had been on the run for several years. In a moment, the information that proviene... His lawyer said McAfee was found strangled in his cell and that his family would seek to establish responsibility for his death. U.S. pop star Britney Spears has launched an attack on what she calls an abusive conservative ship that has controlled her life for 13 years at a court hearing. Oh, hey, hey. Oh, oh. Conservatorship has got to go now. Free Britney now. Free Britney now. Speaking in open court for the first time in the case, she accused her father of completely controlling her. She said she had been denied the right to have more children and put on the psychiatric drug lithium against her wishes. Her father, Jamie Spears, was granted control over her affairs by court order in 2008. And finally, more than 300 sea lions have taken over the beaches of Tome in Chile. According to local authorities, the sea lion's descent on the coast could be caused by the presence of killer whales, one of the sea lion's natural predators. The animals are so numerous that some have been moving inland, confusing local pets in the process. No major incidents have been registered so far in Tome as a result of the sea lion's arrival, but authorities have asked people not to feed or approach the animals. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Sami. President Mohamedou Buhari has approved the location of three bedroom houses to the Super Eagle squad that won the 1994 African Nations Cup in Tunisia. Following a memo by the Minister of Works and Housing, Babatun de Fashala, the President approved the allocations in their states of preference. Meanwhile, the Lagos State Governor Babajide Sonwolu has rewarded Nigeria's only individual Olympic gold medalist Chama Ajinwa with a three-bedroom flat. The Lagos State Governor announced that Ajinwa, an assistant commissioner of police, will get a three-bedroom flat at the Babatunde Rajafashila Housing Estate in Ikmori. 
and UEFA has announced that it will scrap the away goals rule for all of its club competitions from next season in favour of extra time and penalty shootout. Introduced in 1965, the rule was used to determine the winner of a two-legged knockout tie in cases where the two teams had scored the same number of goals on aggregate over the two matches. And former interim president of the Confederation of African Football, CAF, Constant Omari, has been suspended from football for one year by FIFA for breaking its ethics code. The former FIFA council member was adjudged to have received benefits from a French company during negotiations with CAF, which resulted in significant financial damage to the African football governing body. And that sports news is back to you, Melissa. Today and the main news again. Bandit struck again in Kaduna State, where the driver of a company was killed and 33 other persons kidnapped in Kachia local government area of the state. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Stay safe.